This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Wisdall, Gainesville, Florida. The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, Chapter 33. They fought like brave men, long and well. They piled that ground with Muslim slain. They conquered, but Bazaris fell, bleeding at every vein. His few surviving comrades saw his smile when rang their loud hurrah, and the red field was won. Then saw in death his eyelids close, calmly, as to a night's repose, like flowers at set of sun. Halleck the sun found the Lenape on the succeeding day a nation of mourners. The sounds of the battle were over, and they had fed fat their ancient grudge, and had avenged their recent quarrel with the Mengwe by the destruction of a whole community. The black and murky atmosphere that floated around the spot where the Hurons had encamped sufficiently announced of itself the fate of that wandering tribe, while hundreds of ravens that struggled above the summits of the mountains or swept in noisy flocks across the wide ranges of the woods furnished a frightful direction to the scene of the combat. In short, any eye at all practiced in the signs of frontier warfare might easily have traced all those unerring evidences of the ruthless results which attend an Indian vengeance. Still, the sun rose on the Lenape nation of mourners. No shouts of success, no songs of triumph were heard in rejoicings for their victory. The latest straggler had returned from his fell employment only to strip himself of the terrific embalms of his bloody calling, and to join in the lamentations of his countrymen as a stricken people. Pride and exultation were supplanted by humility, and the fiercest of human passions was already succeeded by the most profound and unequivocal demonstrations of grief. The lodges were deserted, but a broad belt of earnest faces encircled a spot in their vicinity whither everything possessing life had repaired, and where all were now collected in deep and awful silence. Though beings of every rank and age, of both sexes, and of all pursuits, had united to form this breathing wall of bodies, they were influenced by a single emotion. Each eye was riveted on the center of that ring, which contained the objects of so much and of so common an interest. Six Delaware girls, with their long, dark, flowing tresses falling loosely across their bosoms, stood apart, and only gave proof of their existence as they occasionally strewed sweet-scented herbs and forest flowers on a litter of fragrant plants that, under a pall of Indian robes, supported all that now remained of the ardent, high-souled, and generous Cora. Her form was concealed in many wrappers of the same simple manufacture, and her face was shut forever from the gaze of men. At her feet was seated the desolate Monroe. His aged head was bowed nearly to the earth in compelled submission to the stroke of providence, but a hidden anguish struggled about his furrowed brow that was only partially concealed by the careless locks of gray that had fallen, neglected, on his temples. Gamut stood at his side, his meek head barred to the rays of the sun while his eyes wandering and concerned, seemed to be equally divided between that little volume which contained so many quaint but holy maxims, and the being in whose behalf his soul yearned to administer consolation. Hayward was also nigh supporting himself against a tree, and endeavoring to keep down those sudden risings of sorrow that it required his utmost manhood to subdue. But sad and melancholy as this group may easily be imagined, it was far less touching than another, that occupied the opposite space of the same area. Seated, as in life, with his form and limbs raged in grave and decent composure, Yunkus appeared, arrayed in the most gorgeous ornaments that the wealth of the tribe could furnish. Rich plumes nodded above his head. Wampum, gorgets, bracelets, and medals adorned his person in profusion. Though his dull eyes and vacant lineaments too strongly contradicted the idle tale of pride they would convey, Directly in front of the court, Chingachgook was placed, without arms, paint, or adornment of any sort except the bright blue blazonry of his race that was indelibly impressed on his naked bosom. 
During the long period that the tribe had thus been collected, the Mohican warrior had kept a steady, anxious look on the cold and senseless countenance of his son. So riveted and intense had been that gaze, and so changeless his attitude, that a stranger might not have told the living from the dead, but for the occasional gleamings of a troubled spirit that shot athwart the dark visage of one, and the death-like calm that had forever settled on the lineaments of the other. The scout was hard by, leaning in a pensive posture on his own fatal and avenging weapon, while Tamanund, supported by the elders of his nation, occupied a high place at hand, whence he might look down on the mute and sorrowful assemblage of his people. Just within the inner edge of the circle stood a soldier, in the military attire of a strange nation, and without it his war-horse, in the center of a collection of mounted domestics, seemingly in readiness to undertake some distant journey. The vestments of the stranger announced him to be one who held a responsible situation near the person of the captain of the Canadas, and who, as it would now seem, finding his errand of peace frustrated by the fierce impetuosity of his allies, was content to become silent and sad spectator of the fruits of a contest that he had arrived too late to anticipate. The day was drawing to the close of its first quarter, and yet had the multitude maintained its breathing stillness since its dawn. No sound louder than a stifled sob had been heard among them, nor had even a limb been moved throughout that long and painful period, except to perform the simple and touching offerings that were made from time to time in commemoration of the dead. The patience and forbearance of Indian fortitude could alone support such an appearance of abstraction as seemed now to have turned each dark and motionless figure into stone. At length the sage of the Delawares stretched forth an arm, and leaning on the shoulders of his attendants, he arose with an air as feeble as if another age had already intervened between the man who had met his nation the preceding day, and him who now tottered on his elevated stand. "'Men of the Lenape,' he said in low, hollow tones that sounded like a voice charged with some prophetic mission, "'the face of the Manitou is behind a cloud. His eyes turn from you, his ears are shut.' His tongue gives no answer. You see him not, yet his judgments are before you. Let your hearts be open and your spirits tell no lie. Men of the Lenape, the face of the Manitou is behind a cloud. As the simple and yet terrible annunciation stole on the ears of the multitude, a stillness as deep and awful succeeded as if the venerated spirit they worship had uttered the words without the aid of human organs, and even the inanimate Yunkas appeared a being of life compared with the humbled and submissive throng by whom he was surrounded. As the immediate effect, however, gradually passed away, a low murmur of voices commenced a sort of chant in honor of the dead. The sounds were those of females, and were thrillingly soft and wailing. The words were connected by no regular continuation, but as one ceased, another took up the eulogy or lamentation, whichever it might be called, and gave vent to her emotions in such language as was suggested by her feelings and the occasion. At intervals the speaker was interrupted by general and loud bursts of sorrow, during which the girls around the byre of Cora plucked the plants and flowers blindly from her body, as if bewildered with grief. But... In the milder moments of their plaint, these emblems of purity and sweetness were cast back to their places, with every sign of tenderness and regret. Though rendered less connected by many and general interruptions and outbreakings, a translation of their language would have contained a regular decant which, in substance, might have proved to possess a train of consecutive ideas. A girl selected for the task by her rank and qualifications, commenced by modest allusions to the qualities of the deceased warrior, embellishing her expressions with those oriental images that the Indians have probably brought with them from the extremes of the other continent, and which form of themselves linked to connect the ancient histories of the two worlds. She called him the panther of his tribe, and described him as one whose moccasin left no trail on the dews, whose bound was like the leap of a young fawn, whose eyes were brighter than a star in the dark night, and whose voice, in battle, 
was loud as the thunder of the Manitou. She reminded him of the mother who bore him, and dwelt forcibly on the happiness she must feel in passing such a son. She bade him tell her, when they met in the world of spirits, that the Delaware girls had shed tears above the grave of her child, and had called her blessed. Then they who succeeded, changing their tones to a milder and still more tender strain, alluded, with the delicacy and sensitiveness of women to the stranger maiden, who had left the upper earth at a time so near his own departure, as to render the will of the great spirit to manifest to be disregarded. They admonished him to be kind to her, and to have consideration for her ignorance of those arts which were so necessary to the comfort of a warrior like himself. They dwelled upon her matchless beauty, and on her noble resolution without the taint of envy, and as angels may be thought to delight in a superior excellence, adding that these endowments should prove more than equivalent for any little imperfection in her education. After which, others again, in due succession, spoke to the maiden herself in the low, soft language of tenderness and love. They exhorted her to be of cheerful mind, and to fear nothing for her future welfare. A hunter would be her companion, who knew how to provide for her smallest wants, and a warrior was at her side who was able to protect her against every danger. They promised that her path should be pleasant and her burden light. They cautioned her against unavailing regrets for the friends of her youth and the scenes where her father had dwelt, assuring her that the blessed hunting grounds of the lamp contained vales as pleasant, streams as pure, and flowers as sweet as the heaven of the pale faces. They advised her to be attentive to the wants of her companion, and never to forget the distinction which the Manitou had so wisely established between them. Then, in a wild burst of their chant, they sang with united voices the temper of the Mohican's mind. They pronounced him noble, manly, and generous. All that became a warrior, and all that a maiden might love. Clothing their ideas in the most remote and subtle images, they betrayed that, in the short period of their intercourse, they had discovered with the intuitive perception of their sex the truant disposition of his inclinations. The Delaware girls had found no favor in his eyes. He was of a race that had once been lords of the shores of the Salt Lake, and his wishes had led him back to a people who dwelt above the graves of his fathers. Why should not such a predilection be encouraged? That she was of a blood purer and richer than the rest of her nation any eye might have seen, that she was equal to the dangers and daring of a life in the woods, her conduct had proved. And now, they added, the wise one of the earth had transplanted her to a place where she would find congenial spirits and might be forever happy. Then, with another transition in voice and subject, illusions were made to the virgin who wept in the adjacent lodge. They compared her to the flakes of snow, as pure as white, as brilliant, and as liable to melt in the fierce heats of summer, or congenial in the frosts of winter. They doubted not that she was lovely in the eyes of the young chief, whose skin and whose sorrow seemed so like her own, but though far from expressing such preference, it was evident they deemed her less excellent than the maid they mourned. Still they denied her no need her rare charms might properly claim. Her ringlets were compared to the exuberant tendrils of the vine, her eye to the blue vault of heavens, and the most spotless cloud, with its glowing flush of the sun, was admitted to be less attractive than her bloom. During these and similar songs nothing was audible but the murmurs of the music, relieved, as it was, or rather rendered terrible by those occasional bursts of grief which might be called its choruses. The Delawares themselves listened like charmed men and it was very apparent, by the variations of their speaking countenances, how deep and true was their sympathy. Even David was not reluctant to lend his ear to the tones of voices so sweet, and long ere the chant was ended, his gaze announced that his soul was enthralled. The scout, to whom alone of all the white men the words were intelligible, suffered himself to be a little aroused from his meditative posture, and bent his face aside to catch their meaning as the girls proceeded. But when they spoke of the future prospects of Korah and Uncas, he shook his head like one who knew the air of their simple creed, and resuming his reclining attitude, he maintained it until the ceremony, if that might be called a ceremony, 
in which his feeling was so deeply imbued, was finished. Happily for the self-command of both Hayward and Monroe, they knew not the meaning of the wild sounds they heard. Chingachgook was a solitary exception to the interest manifested by the native part of the audience. His look never changed throughout the whole of the scene, nor did a muscle move in his rigid countenance, even at the wildest or the most pathetic parts of the lamentation. The cold and senseless remains of his son was all to him, and every other sense but that of sight seemed frozen, in order that his eyes might take their final gaze at those lineaments he had so long loved and which were now about to be closed forever from his view. In this stage of the obsequies, a warrior much renowned for deed in arms, and more especially for services in the recent combat, a man of stern and grave demeanor, advanced slowly from the crowd, and placed himself nigh the person of the dead. "'Why hast thou left us, pride of the Wapanachki? he said, addressing himself to the dull ears of Yunkis, as if the empty clay retained the faculties of the animated man. Thy time has been like that of the sun when in the trees, thy glory brighter than his light at noonday. Thou art gone, youthful warrior, but a hundred Wyandots are clearing the briars from thy path to the world of spirits. Who that saw thee in battle would believe that thou couldst die? Who before thee has ever shown Utawa the way into the fight? Thy feet were like the wings of eagles, thine arm heavier than falling branches from the pine, and thy voice like the Manitou when he speaks in the clouds. The tongue of Utawa is weak, he added, looking about him with a melancholy gaze, and his heart exceeding heavy. Pride of the Wapanachki, why hast thou left us? He was succeeded by others, in due order, until most of the high and gifted men of the nation had sung or spoken their tribute of praise over the manes of the deceased chief. When each had ended, another deep and breathing silence reigned in all the place. Then a low, deep sound was heard, like the suppressed accompaniments of distant music rising just high enough on the air to be audible, and yet so indistinctly as to leave its character and the place whence it proceeded alike matters of conjecture. It was, however, succeeded by another, and another strain, each in a higher key, until they grew on the ear, first in long, drawn, and often repeated interjection, and finally in words. The lips of Chingachgook had so far parted as to announce that it was the monody of the father, Though not an eye was turned toward him, nor the smallest sign of impatience exhibited, it was apparent by the manner in which the multitude elevated their heads to listen, that they drank in the sounds with an intenseness of attention that none but Temenund himself had ever before commanded. But they listened in vain. The strains rose just so loud as to become intelligible, and then grew fainter and more trembling until they finally sank on the air as if borne away by a passing breath of wind. The lips of the sagamore closed, and he remained silent in his seat, looking with his riveted eye in motionless form, like some creature that had been turned from the almighty hand with the form but without the spirit of a man. The Delawares, who knew by these symptoms that the mind of their friend was not prepared for so mighty an effort of fortitude, relaxed in their attention and, with an innate delicacy, seemed to bestow all their thoughts on the obsequies of the stranger maiden. A signal was given by one of the elder chiefs to the women who crowded that part of the circle near which the body of Cora lay. Obedient to the sign, the girls raised the bier to the elevation of their heads and advanced with slow and regulated steps, chanting, as they proceeded, another wailing song in praise of the deceased. Gamut, who had been a close observer of rites he deemed so heathenish, now bent his head over the shoulder of the unconscious father, whispering, "'They move with the remains of thy child. Shall we not follow, and see them interned with Christian burial?' Monroe started, as if the last trumpet had sounded in his ear, and bestowing one anxious and hurried glance round him, he arose and followed in the simple train with the mien of a soldier but bearing the full burden of a parent's suffering. His friends pressed around him with a sorrow that was too strong to be termed sympathy. 
even the young Frenchman joining in the procession with the air of a man who is sensibly touched at the early and melancholy fate of one so lovely. But when the last and humblest female of the tribe had joined in the wild and yet ordered array, the men of the Lenape contracted their circle, and formed again around the person of Uncas, as silent, as grave, and as motionless as before. The place which had been chosen for the grave of coral was a little knoll, where a cluster of young and healthful pines had taken root, forming of themselves a melancholy and appropriate shade over the spot. On reaching it the girls deposited their burden, and continued for many minutes waiting, with characteristic patience and native timidity, for some evidence that they whose feelings were most concerned were content with the arrangement. At length the scout, who alone understood their habits, said in their own language, "'My daughters have done well. The white men thank them.' Satisfied with this testimony in their favor, the girls proceeded to deposit the body in a shell, ingeniously and not inelegantly fabricated of the bark of the birch after which they lowered it into its dark and final abode. The ceremony of covering the remains, and concealing the marks of the fresh earth by leaves and other natural and customary objects, was conducted with the same simple and silent forms. But when the labors of the kind beings who had performed these sad and friendly offices were so far completed, they hesitated, in a way to show that they knew not how much further they might proceed. It was in this stage of the rites that the scout again addressed them. "'My young women have done enough,' he said. "'The spirit of the pale-face has no need of food of raiment, their gifts being accorded to the heaven of their color. I see,' he added, glancing an eye at David, who was preparing his book in a manner that indicated an intention to lead the way in a sacred song, "'that one who better knows the Christian fashions is about to speak.' The females stood modestly aside, and, from having been the principal actors in the scene, they now became the meek and attentive observers of that which followed. During the time David occupied in pouring out the pious feelings of his spirit in this manner, not a sign of surprise nor a look of impatience escaped them. They listened like those who knew the meaning of the strange words, and appeared as if they felt the mingled emotions of sorrow, hope, and resignation they were intended to convey. Excited by the scene he had just witnessed, and perhaps influenced by his own secret emotions, the master of song exceeded his usual efforts. His full, rich voice was not found to suffer by comparison with the soft tones of the girls, and his more modulated strains possessed, at least for the ears of those to whom they were peculiarly addressed, the additional powers of intelligence. He ended the anthem as he had commenced it, in the midst of a grave and solemn stillness. When, however, the closing cadence had fallen on the ears of his auditors, the secret, timorous glances of the eyes and the general yet subdued movement of the assemblage betrayed that something was expected from the father of the deceased. Monroe seemed sensible that the time was come for him to exert what is, perhaps, the gravest effort of which human nature is capable. He bared his gray locks, and looked around the timid and quiet throng by which he was encircled with a firm and collected countenance. Then, motioning with his hand for the scout to listen, he said, uh, Say to these kind and gentle females that a heart-broken and failing man returns them his thanks. Tell them that the being we all worship, under different names, will be mindful of their charity and that the time shall not be distant when we may assemble around his throne without distinction of sex, or rank, or color. The scout listened to the tremulous voice in which the veteran delivered these words, and shook his head slowly when they were ended, as one who doubted their efficacy. To tell them this, he said, would be to tell them that the snows come not in winter, or that the sun shines fiercest when the trees are stripped of their leaves. Then, turning to the women, he made such a communication of the other's gratitude as he deemed most suited to the capacities of his listeners. The head of Monroe had already sunk upon his chest, and he was again fast relapsing into melancholy, 
when the young Frenchman before named ventured to touch him lightly on the elbow. As soon as he had gained the attention of the mourning old man, he pointed towards a group of young Indians who approached with a light but closely covered litter, and then pointed upward towards the sun. "'I understand you, sir,' returned Munro, with a voice of forced firmness. "'I understand you. It is the will of heaven, and I submit. "'Cora, my child! If the prayers of a heart-broken father could avail thee now, how blessed shouldst thou be! "'Come, gentlemen,' he added, looking about him with an air of lofty composure, though the anguish that quivered in his faded countenance was far too powerful to be concealed. "'Our duty here is ended. Let us depart.' Hayward gladly obeyed a summons that took them from a spot where, each instant, he felt his self-control was about to desert him. While his companions were mounting, however, he found time to press the hand of the scout, and to repeat the terms of an engagement they had made to meet again within the posts of the British army. Then, gladly throwing himself into the saddle, he spurred his charger to the side of the litter, when slow and stifled sobs alone announced the presence of Alice. In this manner, the head of Monroe again drooping on his bosom, with Hayward and David following in sorrowing silence, and attended by the aid of Montcalm with his guard, all the white men, with the exception of Hawkeye, passed from before the eyes of the Delawares, and were buried in the vast forests of that region. But the tie which through common calamity, had united the feelings of these simple dwellers in the woods with the strangers who had thus transiently visited them, was not so easily broken. Years passed away before the traditionary tale of the white maiden, and of the young warrior of the Mohicans, ceased to beguile the long nights and tedious marches, or to animate their youthful and brave with a desire for vengeance. Neither were the secondary actors in these momentous incidents forgotten, through the medium of the scout, who served for years afterward as a link between them and civilized life, they learned in answers to their inquiries that the gray head was speedily gathered to his father's, borne down, as was erroneously believed by his military misfortunes, and that the open hand had conveyed his surviving daughter far into the settlements of the Pale Faces where her tears had at least ceased to flow, and had been succeeded by the bright smiles which were better suited to her joyous nature. But these were events of a time later than that which concerns our tale. Deserted by all of his color, Hawkeye returned to the spot where his sympathies led him, with a force that no ideal bond of union could destroy. He was just in time to catch a parting look of the features of Uncas, the Delawares were already enclosing in his last vestment of skins. They paused to permit the longing and lingering gaze of the sturdy woodsman, and when it was ended the body was enveloped, never to be unclosed again. Then came a procession like the other, and the whole nation was collected about the temporary grave of the chief, temporary because it was proper that, at some future day, his bones should rest among those of his own people. The movement like the feeling had been simultaneous in general, the same grave expression of grief, the same rigid silence, and the same deference to the principal mourner were observed around the place of interment as have been already described. The body was deposited in an attitude of repose, facing the rising sun with the implements of war and of the chase at hand, in readiness for the final journey. An opening was left in the shell, by which it was protected from the soil for the spirit to communicate with its earthly tenement, when necessary, and the hole was concealed from the instinct, and protected by the ravages of the beast of prey, with an ingenuity peculiar to the natives. The manual rites then ceased, and all present reverted to the more spiritual part of the ceremonies. Chingachgook became once more the object of the common attention. He had not yet spoken, and something solitary and instructive was expected from so renowned a chief on an occasion of such interest. Conscious of the wishes of the people, the stern and self-restrained warrior raised his face, which had latterly been buried in his robe, and looked about him with a steady eye. 
his firmly compressed and expressive lips then severed, and for the first time during the long ceremonies his voice was distinctly audible. "'Why do my brothers mourn?' he said, regarding the dark race of dejected warriors by whom he was environed. "'Why do my daughters weep? That the young man has gone to the happy hunting-grounds? Uh, that the chief has filled his time with honor? He was good. He was dutiful. He was brave. Who can deny it? The Manitou had need of such a warrior, and he has called him away. As for me, the son and the father of Uncas, I am a blazed pine and a clearing of the pale-faces. My race has gone from the shores of the salt lake and the hills of the Delawares. But who can say that the serpent of his tribe has forgotten his wisdom? I am alone. No! No! cried Hawkeye, who had been gazing with a yearning look at the rigid features of his friend with something like his own self-command, but whose philosophy could endure no longer. No, Sagamore, not alone. The gifts of our colors may be different, but God has so placed us as to journey in the same path. I have no kin, and I may also say, like you, no people. He was your son, and a redskin by nature, and it may be that your blood was near. But, if I ever I forget the lad who has so often fought at my side in war, and slept at my side in peace, may he who made us all, whatever may be our color or our gifts, forget me. The boy has left us for a time, but— Sagamore, you are not alone. Chingachgook grasped the hand that, in the warmth of feeling, the scout had stretched across the fresh earth, and in an attitude of friendship these two sturdy and intrepid woodsmen bowed their heads together, while scalding tears fell to their feet, watering the grave of Uncas like drops of falling rain. In the midst of the awful stillness with which such a burst of feeling coming as it did from the two most renowned warriors of that region was received, Temenon lifted his voice to disperse the multitude. "'It is enough,' he said. "'Go, children of the Lenape. The anger of the Manitou is not done. Why should Temenon stay? The pale faces are masters of the earth, and the time of the red men has not yet come again. My day has been too long.' In the morning I saw the sons of Unimus happy and strong, and yet, before the night has come, have I lived to see the last warrior of the wise race of the Mohicans. End of The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper